21 convention. And the 21 convention is about the ideal man and shaping that ideal man. And I know from my own journey, what I discovered through this was so much, a whole new world of diet, exercise, and fitness. It, it changed my life. And it actually, it's the one thing that I've seen change so many attendees and even speakers' lives. So right now, we actually have a PhD in exercise physiology and biomechanics, also 21 convention speaker alumni, all the way from the UK to the US to speak for you guys. We have Mr. James Steele. Let's see. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and take a little sip of water first. Just apologize. My throat's been a bit sore this week, so hopefully my voice holds out for the whole of the talk. Um, okay, just to give you a bit of an overview of what the talk's going to be about and the purpose of the talk. Um, for those of you who have seen it already, I, I, I've given this talk before. This is the second time I've given it. Um, but I've got a bit more time to go into a bit more detail and try and conceptualize some of the ideas, uh, a bit more, make them a bit more contextual for you guys here. So... Um, the title of the talk is uh, A Synthesis of Modern Exercise Physiology and Evolutionary Theory. And uh, to start off with, I'm just going to go through and kind of explain what my thinking was and uh, what the purpose of the talk was about, what, what brought me to actually want to discuss this topic in a bit more detail. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to warn you guys, this is going to be a bit of a change of tact for um, what you've experienced for the most of the day. This is going to be quite an academic talk, so uh, expect a lot of references, citations, I'm going to make sure you're all taking notes, and I'm going to pass a quiz out at the end. So uh, you'll get your grades back uh, by Sunday. OK, so let's get started. Ooh, if the clicker wants to work. There we go. Right, OK. So the talk's going to cover this idea of kind of evolutionary fitness or paleo fitness. The whole kind of uh, paleo idea has become very, very popular within the lay press and the academic sphere over the last few years. I mean, everyone here has probably heard of the paleo diet. Hands up if you've heard of the paleo diet. There we go, that's pretty much everyone. Okay, so it, it's got a lot more momentum, it's become a lot more popular, and something that's kind of rolled up in the whole idea of a paleo diet has been this idea of paleo fitness as well. So the idea that we should be uh, exercising in an evolutionary, evolutionarily congruent manner. Um, and this has been, becoming more and more popular in the lay press. So we've got various books, we've got MoveNat, CrossFit, although um, I'm, we're going to have to sort of pretend that if the clicker works. There we go. Pretend I didn't say uh, CrossFit because apparently they're actually suing the NSCA at the moment. So we'll pretend I wasn't talking about CrossFit just in case this comes back to bite me in the ass. So, uh, but anyway, it's been very, very popular in terms of the lay press and the academic sphere recently. Um, there's been a number of uh, review papers covering the idea that we should be exercising like our evolutionarily, uh, evolutionary ancestors. We should be exercising in a paleo or evolutionary fitness type approach. And there's some justification for this. If the clicker wants to go. There we go, right. And there's some justification for this. So, if you've read any of the literature or you've familiarized yourselves with the works of guys like uh, Lauren Cordain, Rob Wolf, you tend to see that the same few studies are trotted out over and over and over again to support the idea that hunter-gatherers, evolutionary man, was fit, robust, healthy, fast, strong, had good body composition, low body fat, good hip to waist ratio, so on and so forth. And you get given this very romantic picture of what hunter-gatherers look like. Now, what I wanted to do was actually go back into the literature and look at it with a bit more of a sober perspective, a bit more skepticism, and see whether or not the whole body of literature actually supported this view. Because I didn't necessarily think that this was just all there was to see. These are only a few studies, so I wanted to go in and see whether or not the whole of the literature actually supported this viewpoint. So, as I said, I think this is a bit of a romantic view. So let's just cover physical activity in general quickly. So we all know that physical activity is beneficial to our health and well-being, our fitness. And we know that physical activity, it protects against all cause mortality and morbidity in a dose response type manner. So the more we're physically active, the more we see a reduction in our risk for all cause mortality and different morbidities. But recently, 
studies have started to question whether or not the volume of activity, i.e. how much we're active, actually provides the benefits that we think it does. And we've started to find that actually the intensity of effort involved in the activity, so how hard the exercise actually is, seems to provide a much more powerful benefit. So if we're exercising in a more intense manner, we tend to see significantly greater reductions in all-cause mortality and survival statistics. And this ties up actually as well with studies that show that physical fitness parameters seem to be even stronger predictors of all-cause mortality health and well-being. So for example, VO2 max is one of the strongest predictors of cardiac disease, morbidity and mortality as well. We tend to see that VO2 max is higher in the obese yet metabolically healthier, healthy and lower in those who are normal weight but metabolically obese. Even strength and muscle mass are significant predictors of health and well-being and reduced all-cause mortality. So it seems to be that actually what's more important is the intensity of the activity. And this is what modern exercise physiology is starting to support. So what I wanted to do was actually take some of these concepts and go back and look at the literature regarding our evolutionary past and what our physical activity patterns were in that evolutionary past. So in terms of evolutionary fitness recommendations, in general we're asking the question, what should we do? Now, up until now, authors have based the answer to that question on two other questions. So they've either looked at the evolved traits determining our physical activity limitations and capacities, i.e. asking what can we do, what are we evolved for, what adaptations do we have that permit us to involve ourselves in certain activities, and what are the limitations to those uh, activities. Or what did we do in terms of what were the physical activity patterns and physical activity levels of extinct and extant hunter-gatherers. And this is what most of the literature has based its ideas on. So what I wanted to do was go through and actually try and answer those questions in order to provide a an answer to the question of what should we be doing in terms of exercise? What does the research actually support? So what this is going to do is provide an, a synthesis of the modern exercise physiology research with research into evolutionary physical activity patterns in order to provide an answer of what we should be doing. Now, I just want to provide a bit of a kind of limitation on this because I'm coming at it from the perspective that Physical fitness seems to be a very strong predictor of health and well-being. So although, yes, there may be other arguments for taking part in certain physical activities for other outcomes, I'm going to focus the talk on what's the best way and what should we be doing to actually promote physical fitness? Because that seems to be one of the strongest predictors of all-cause mortality and morbidity. I also want to make the point that, obviously, Within our evolutionary past, physical activity was directed towards survival, whereas today we have the luxury that we don't have to be physically active. Instead, we have to directly engage in exercise in order to achieve these outcomes that we're interested in. So I want to differentiate between physical activity in terms of general and occupational physical activity as opposed to exercise, i.e. recommendations as to what we should be doing to actually achieve these outcomes. This is going to slow me down. Am I not pressing the button hard enough? There we go. Right. So the question is, what exercise should we be doing? So the outline of the presentation is going to answer the questions of what can we do, what did we do, what should we do, and then try and provide some conclusions and recommendations. So in terms of what can we do, I want to look at the activity repertoire that our bodies have actually evolved for. What sort of activities can we do? Now, it doesn't necessarily answer whether we should do them, though, but some answer to that question will help lead us towards an answer of what should we do. I also want to look at what did we do. So I want to look back into the past at other primate species, at extinct hunter-gatherers, and at extant hunter-gatherer populations that are still around to see what their physical activity patterns and levels were actually like, to try and provide some sort of answer. And then finally, what I want to do is actually synthesise that with the exercise physiology literature and what that currently suggests in terms of what's best in terms of exercise recommendations. <clears throat> okay, so, to start off with then, what activity repertoire have we actually evolved and adapted for? Now, there's a few things we need to keep in mind when we're talking about evolutionary adaptations. And I'm going to take some concepts from Dan Lieberman here with regards to evolutionary adaptation. So what is an adaptation? So in terms of evolution, an adaptation is a useful feature that's been shaped by natural collection, uh, selection that promotes survival and reproduction. So it's important to differentiate between what we mean by physical fitness, which I've been referring to up until now, and reproductive fitness. So 
An evolutionary adaptation is something that promotes reproductive fitness, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it promotes our physical fitness or our health and our well-being. In today's society, physical uh, reproductive fitness is more heavily influenced by a number of other factors. So we're differentiating between adaptations in terms of evolutionary fitness or reproductive fitness and adaptations that might promote physical fitness. Because not all ancestral adaptations are good for us, but conversely, not all modern adaptations are bad for us. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. So what sort of things are we actually evolved for? Well, bipedalism is clearly something that we've adapted for. We're all bipedal. Everyone can stand up if they want to. Everyone can walk out of the room. Heck, most people can run if they want to. So we've clearly evolved for bipedalism. Now, in a talk I did a few years ago, I actually talked a bit about the emergence of bipedalism. So what sort of stages we went through. We started off as arboreal quadrupeds. We went through a stage where we evolved into more semi-terrestrial quadrupedalism when we look at great ape locomotor patterns. Whereas today, we're now habitual bipeds. And that was accompanied by a number of different adaptations, including changes in the lumbar and pelvic structure and changes in the hip and uh, lumbar and hip musculature as well. And there are a number of other documented adaptations relating to our ability to be bipedal. They include a neutral ligament to keep the head upright when we're moving bipedally. We have changes in our morphology for our Achilles tendon, providing more elastic energy to help with locomotion. And there are a number and a host of other adaptations, too many to go through in this, in this presentation. Now, the reasons for us evolving bipedalism are many. They involve changes in our environment, increased ability to obtain food, avoiding predation. It increased our cost uh, or reduced our uh, energy savings for cost of transport, but not necessarily for running. So there were many pressures involved in determining bipedalism as an evolutionary adaptation. And as I said, a number of adaptive advantages to that. So being bipedal meant that we were upright, it increased our visual field. It reduced our cost of transport, which meant that we could walk further throughout the day. It also increased our ability to firm and regulate. Standing upright meant there was more wind that could uh, help reduce our body temperatures. We also experienced much less solar radiation as well. And obviously, standing upright frees your hands for tool use as well. So there are a number of advantages for being bipedal. It's clear we have evolved to be bipedal. But that doesn't necessarily imply that being bi bipedal should dictate what types of exercise we should be doing. Now, our upper body physical capacity has significantly and dramatically altered as well. We've obviously lost a lot of the specialization for our boreal type quadru quadrupedalism and our boreal locomotion. Now, if we look at the capacity in terms of our upper body in early humans, we see that they were typically quite heavily muscled. That may be down to the fact that hafted levers weren't available at that time, so we needed greater physical capacity. But it's very difficult to determine whether or not we were more muscular because of the environment or whether or not we adapted to be more muscular. And you tend to see as well, there's, there is a general reduction in the musculature that's coincident with greater tool specialization. So as we've gone through our evolutionary history, we've typically lost a lot of our physical capacity. But as I said, it's difficult to determine whether that's an evolutionary adaptation or actually just a reflection of our physical activity patterns. A final thing to note in terms of what we've adapted for. Our body is highly plastic. It tends to respond to the demands that we place on it. The capacity that we have broadly matches those demands. The body doesn't want to waste anything. So unless you place a specific demand on it, it doesn't want to invest resources in actually producing adaptations. So in fact, our bodies being a plastic system was an evolutionary adaptation for energy savings in the first place. So it's important to realize that we are an adaptive species in terms of our body's plasticity. It will respond in a number of ways to the stimuli that it experiences. But again, that's quite general. It's very difficult to draw recommendations from that. OK, so let's move on then to what were the physical activity patterns in our evolutionary past. We know kind of what we're adapted for. We're bipedal. We're not as muscular as we used to be. We're not as specialized in terms of our upper body locomotion abilities. We can use tools. We've adapted those types of specializations. But it doesn't really tell us a lot in terms of drawing exercise recommendations from that. Now, maybe if we look at the physical activity patterns in our evolutionary past, we might be able to draw out some specific activities that we did involve ourselves in, or at least how active we were. 
Now, typically, most studies have looked at the energy expenditure of physical activity and tried to draw recommendations from that. So they've broadly kind of said, well, extinct and extant hunter-gatherers, they were pretty active, so we should be more active. Well, that's great. But that doesn't give you any specificity in terms of recommendations. How should I be more active? Should I run? Should I lift weights? Should I bike? Should I swim? Should I row? doesn't really provide a lot of information. It just tells you you should be more physically active. And you typically see tables like this, filling up these papers, showing you caloric, uh, caloric expenditure in terms of different hunter-gatherer populations, different types of activities that they might have been engaging in. And it's all well and good. But I don't think it's good enough in terms of providing recommendations. So what I wanted to do was instead look over and synthesize exercise program variables by looking at the physical activity patterns of extinct and extant hunter-gatherers and trying to draw out those variables. So how often were they exercising, or how often were they physically active? How much were they physically active? What was the sort of range that they were active over? How long were they physically active for? What duration did they engage in? How hard was the physical activity that they engaged in? What sort of intensity of effort did they put forth into it? What was the types of loading they experienced as well? It's difficult to actually pick that out, but we can look at the types and modalities that they were engaged in as well to give us more of an idea of what types and modalities of exercise we potentially should be taking part in. And ultimately, the question I'm asking is, what effect does the manipulation of these variables actually have on physical fitness? Because that's the information that we're interested in in terms of providing recommendations. So let's start off with looking at other primates then, our closest cousins. So if you look at arboreal quadrupeds, old world monkeys, new world monkeys, small bodied quadrupedal mammals, their frequency of exercise tends to be very, very seasonal. So depending upon the season, they will be more or less active. It depends highly on the, the availability of food, the availability of mates, so on and so forth. But the types and modalities of exercise they engage in are very, very consistent. So they spend a lot of time clambering, climbing, sitting, walking, running, bounding, brachiating, which is swinging from arm to arm. But actually, if you look at the volume of activity they engage in, it's actually quite low. It wasn't anywhere near as high as I imagined it would be. Has any of you guys been to the zoo and gone to watch the monkeys and sat there wondering why they're all asleep? Because they actually spend a lot of time sleeping. They spend a lot of time sitting around, standing, not really doing a lot, just resting. In fact, monkeys are pretty sedentary, so they should all be obese and unhealthy and dying. And, but funnily enough, they're not. They tend to spend a, lot of, spend a lot of time sitting, and apparently this is killing us. So today, you guys are fucked. I mean, you've, you've been sitting all day, so you're going to be dead by the end of today. Uh, well, by the end of Sunday. I mean, you guys have got three days' worth of this. So I, you know, I, I feel for you guys. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand at the back for the rest of the days, just in case. Anyway, you see the point I'm making. I'm being a bit facetious here. If we look at other primate species as well, I'm sorry, if we look at different types of species, we do see there's some individual variation, but actually they do spend a considerable amount of time just resting. They spend a lot of time just chilling out, feeding, sitting, socialising, not that much time actually engaged in physical activity, or certainly not vigorous physical activity that we would expect. Okay, but what about the bigger apes? So the bigger bodied apes, the great apes, like uh, uh, sorry, uh, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, they tend to have a slightly larger range, which is reflective of their body size. But again, we tend to see that they spend a lot of time engaged in certain types of activities for the small amount of time that they are actually active. They do spend a lot of time sitting around feeding, but again, that might actually be related to their gut physiology. But in essence, other primates tend to be pretty lazy pretty sedentary. They spend a lot of time sitting. Interestingly as well, they actually spend little time socializing and playing. Like I would have expected them to spend a lot more time playing. You know, one of the kind of tenets of paleo fitness is that we should be playing, not exercising. It surprised me that they spend very little time actually engaged in those types of activities. Okay. But what about extinct hunter-gatherers? Because obviously other primates, you know, they're, they're evolutionarily close to us, but they're not us. What about early hunter-gatherers, the extinct hunter-gatherer populations? What do we get if we look over their remains? So this is where I kind of expected to uh, spend a bit of time delving into the literature, looking at uh, what the skeletal remains actually showed, and trying to figure out what frequency of activity they engaged in, how much they engaged in it, what types of loadings they experienced, and be able to pull out these ideas that they were super fit, super healthy, and they were really physically active. But, and as 
Robert Germain and his colleagues have said, it actually turns out it's a bit of a uh, holy grail. It tends to be something that's very difficult to find. In fact, when I actually looked into the literature, it felt a bit like it was doing this back at me. Go. Tart in your dimmer direction. Your mother was a hamster, and your father smelt of elderberry. For those of you who love Monty Python. But it felt a bit like that. I started looking into the literature, and it was very, very difficult to actually draw anything out. So, even, oh, gone too far ahead then. Even two decades ago, researchers were saying that there's no clear physical activity pattern or level that's specific to extinct hunter gatherer populations. It varies massively by geography, it mass varies massively by culture, <coughs> massively by technological advancement. We tend to find that even in uh, different populations, sometimes there is sexual dimorphism, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there is sexual division of labor, sometimes there isn't. So it's difficult to draw out gender-specific recommendations, particularly from that. What's interesting as well is when you actually look at the skeletal remains, the skeletal robustity remains, musculoskeletal markers of uh, loading, we tend to see that actually some studies show that hunter-gatherer populations experience just as much physical loading as agricultural populations. Some seem to experience more, indicating they're potentially more active, but some actually experience less. And also some studies indicate that there's not much of a difference between hunter-gatherer populations and modern populations as well. So it makes it very difficult to actually say that they were more physically active. Also, it's really difficult to say what types or modes of exercise they actually engaged in. You know, if you look at these exercise programs given out by the paleo fitness experts, they typically involved primal movement patterns. We don't know what they were. If we actually look at the studies, the musculoskeletal stress markers that we look at, which we would hope indicate what types of loading they experience, don't always tie up with cultural remains. They don't always tie up with the types of technology we find with them. So it's very difficult to say that they were actually engaged in one particular set of activities or one particular type of activity, because the two don't tie up. Another interesting point as well is that when you look into some of the sports medicine literature, over the last few years, we've started to look at different types of uh, mus uh, um, changes in skeletal geometry in response to different types of loading patterns. So they've compared like sprinters, endurance runners, hockey players, to try and differentiate between the types of skeletal geometry that we see in those engaged in endurance running, those engaged in intermittent sprinting or activities that involve change of direction. And some studies show that there are good correlations between certain types of skeletal geometry and these activities but then others don't support that link as well. So it makes it very difficult to look back at the early human populations and say, well, they must have been endurance running, or they must have been doing interval training, or that, well, not training, but they must have been intermittently sprinting and so on and so forth. So were we engaged in the types of activities that we typically romantically associate with hunter-gatherers? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, should we be doing it? Maybe, being a bit facetious, we should be doing something like this. Because, and I lo just love the wording in this study, so I wanted to put the quote in here. A um, study was looking at the uh, le skeletal lesions in a group of Neanderthals, and interestingly, the skeletal lesions in this group of Neanderthals were very similar to those seen in rodeo riders. So uh, they concluded that the similarity to rodeo lesion distribution suggests frequent close encounters with large ungulates unkindly disposed to the humans involved. So maybe we should be uh, doing a bit more rodeo writing because clearly that's what we did. Maybe not. Okay, I'm not going to read through that quote, but if any of you are interested in doing a bit more reading around the folly of looking at this type of literature and trying to draw these types of conclusions, Mayer and colleagues have a great review paper talking about these limitations. So it's well worth looking at. One thing I will pull out, though, and this is another big point, is that it's really difficult to look at skeletal remains and actually draw out what adult physical activity patterns were. Because a lot of the time, the skeletal remains we get and the types of uh, geometry that we see in those skeletal remains actually reflect childhood activity patterns during the formative years when the bones are far more susceptible to adapting to those types of stresses. So it makes it even more difficult to actually draw out these patterns. Okay. What about our extant hunter-gatherers? So again, I wanted to look at extant hunter-gatherers, those that are still available to study, look at these variables and try and figure out what produces this, this wonderful romantic notion of the super-fit, super-healthy hunter-gatherer, caveman, cavewoman. 
Okay, so let's start off going for each of the free, each of these variables then. So in terms of frequency, hunter-gatherer populations do tend to be physically active on most days. But when we talk about physical activity, like I said at the start, I want to differentiate between general or occupational physical activity and what we typically consider to be exercise. And most of the physical activity that they engage in, we wouldn't really look at and consider to be exercise, or at least of sufficient vigorousness or intensity of effort to actually be considered exercise. More like chores. Imagine a day of housework, a bit of hoovering, a bit of ironing, maybe a bit of yard work, yard, that sounds weird, I should have said garden, sorry I'm British. But that's typically what you tend to see in those studies. I mean, even if you subscribe to the idea that the males of uh, hunter-gatherer populations typically engage in endurance running or persistence hunting type activities, they typically, oh, I didn't even press that then, they typically only involve themselves in exercise or, or certainly endurance type exercise maybe every three to five days when they were successful on their hunts. It's more difficult to determine when they were unsuccessful. But typically they were engaged in physical activity on most days, maybe more vigorous intensity activity every few days or so. Oh. Okay. But what about the volume of that activity? Okay, so they were doing physical activity, but how much of it were they actually doing? Well, as I've said, we're bipedal, and the types of walking patterns that you see in hunter-gatherer populations typically allow them to expand their range. They don't typically go for a walk and follow one route. They tend to follow random power law distributions when they're foraging to try and increase their range and maximize their yield in terms of foraging. Um, you typically find that, although if you look back at kind of the review articles by Lauren Cordain and James O'Keefe and those guys, they'll pull the magic number or magic range of 6 kilometers to 16 kilometers a day was the typical range for hunter-gatherers. That tends to be based on like one study in the Hadza. Um, when you look at other studies, you typically see that actually they don't tend to move around anywhere near as much as that. Every few weeks or so, they might move camp or they might move on from the position they're in, but typically, whatever location they're in, they maybe only move, or well, certainly some populations, up to around two and a half miles around that in terms of range. It's, you know, they're not walking 16 kilometers a day, as we typically were told by the academics who are writing these articles. If you look at the body of literature, it tends to be highly variable. In fact, some studies show that they spend you know, maybe 70 to 80 hours of their waking day just resting, sitting around, being sedentary, all the stuff that's killing us, apparently, but somehow doesn't kill them. It's a bit like the French paradox. You know, the French eat lots of saturated fat, but they have low heart disease. So obviously the saturated fat that we're eating is killing us, but it's not killing them somehow. It's probably the red wine. For these guys, it's probably the berries and you know, other stuff that they eat. Don't know. Anyway. So I decided, and uh, Greg was talking to me earlier about this, he says, said, I'm a cautious type, I like to have data. So what I did was I went to all the studies and I pulled out the data and I ran some stats on it myself. So I went through and pulled out all of the articles that I could find that had actually recorded physical activity levels, i.e. the ratio of total energy expenditure to resting metabolic rate, to look at and actually compare hunter-gatherer populations, agricultural populations, and modern populations, and also looked at comparing it to this Paleolithic standard that Boyd Eaton and colleagues actually kind of defined as a physical activity level back in 2003. Um, and, and hopefully this will be coming out in a paper that, we're, uh, that I've been invited to publish in Journal of Evolution and Health. But when I ran the stats on it, although there are slight differences between hunter-gatherer agricultural populations and modern populations, they're a little bit more active in terms of the physical activity levels data that we can look at. It's not significantly different, you know. Whether it's big enough to actually have a meaningful effect on their health and fitness, I don't know. But at least when we look at the data, it's certainly not statistically significant. What I think is more interesting, though, is actually the intensity of activity that they're engaged in. So one of the things that does seem to differ between their populations and our populations is the fact that actually they do spend some of their day involved in very high intensity activity. So when you look at the distribution of uh, the vigorousness or the, the difficulty or, the, or how hard the activity they're actually engaged in across the course of a day, you see that they spend quite a lot of time engaged in very sedentary or light activities. Certainly in the populations looked at in these papers, you see that the uh, light gray at the bottom of the graph indicates that they spent a considerable portion of the, of the day sedentary or engaged in light activities. Now, this was really interesting as well, though, is that when you differentiate between day and night in men and women, you might not be able to see it on the graph so much, but at night, 
the men are engaged in maybe a few minutes of very, very vigorous activity. But not the women. So I leave that to you guys to speculate as to what they might be doing. I know what I think they might be doing. They've gone out for an interval session in the middle of the night, of course. But anyway, we typically find that they spend a lot of time in, yeah, some low intensity activity or being very sedentary. If you look at the average speeds at which they move around at, Dr. Kim Hill's observations in the, uh, in the Archie men typically showed that they were walking around at an average of about one and a half to three kilometers an hour. Occasionally, they would involve themselves in short bursts of sprinting, particularly when hunting or foraging. But I mean, 1.5 to three kilometers an hour, that's a really slow stroll. That's, that's not even kind of average walking speed for most populations nowadays. That's, pretty, that's taking it pretty easy. I mean, even when you look at the studies on persistence hunting, the average speed at which they move at is 6.1 kilometers an hour. Now, that's a bit of a route march, but that's not a jog. That's still walking just at a pretty quick pace. But what it indicates is that they were probably involved in some high intensity activity and then a lot of low intensity or sedentary type activity. And even in children as well. We see that in the child populations, they spend a lot of time engaged in very low intensity activity and then occasionally very high intensity activity. And this is what I think might be missing from what most modern populations are engaged in. So what about the types and modalities of exercise that they were engaged in? So we know they were doing high intensity activity, but what types of activity were they engaged in to produce that high intensity? So most of us think about the idea of a hunter-gatherer, and again, coming back to this idea that most in the kind of paleo fitness sphere recommend play, primal play, all these kinds of things, you know, very kind of unstructured, social type physical activity. Studies that have looked at hunter-gatherer populations do indicate that they do engage in a lot of play, but not play as we would think about it, or certainly not play as in is recommended from these uh, paleo fitness guys. So when you look at play, you tend to see that the children engage in a lot of physical activity type play, running around the playground, the types of things you see kids doing in the schoolyard, playground, schoolyard, and doing it again, Americanisms. But when you look at the adults, the play they engage in is more sat around, chatting, cracking jokes, you know, playing pranks, being creative. It's not physical activity play, it's play in spirit. So do we necessarily need to be structuring exercise around this concept of play when even hunter-gatherers own adult physical activity patterns aren't structured around this idea of, well, unstructured play activity? Now, as I said, they did engage in a lot of random walking patterns, but what we typically see is most of that occurs around the camp, the hut, some of it occurs when they go out foraging or hunting, but most of it occurs around the home, for use of a better word. Now, out of interest, I've actually been using a pedometer myself recently, and it's interesting the number of steps I actually take just walking around the house each day. Sometimes before I leave for work, I sometimes accrue 2,000 steps just from walking room to room, picking things up, into the kitchen, make a coffee, into the bathroom, brush my teeth, whatever. You know, we do spend a lot of time walking around the house, and that's typically where we accrue most of our walking-type physical activity. It's surprising how much we actually accrue. And the same applies for hunter-gatherers as well. Most of their walking is just around the camp, around the campsite, around the huts, so on and so forth. Running, did they run? Well, we've got some evidence of persistence hunting, but then we've got other populations where the researchers have never seen a single person in the tribe running. So it's difficult to say we should be running Maybe we should, I don't know, we can, but should we be doing it? I mean, if hunter-gatherers don't do it if they don't need to, should we be going out and racking up miles and miles around the block each day? I don't know. Obviously, we do typically get some kind of sexual division of labor in terms of the types of activities that men and women are engaged in. But again, that doesn't mean we should take those ideas and say, right, the men, if you're exercise, you should be chopping wood. The women, you should be making nets and baskets and those kinds of things. In terms of exercise size, we don't necessarily need to be making that type of distinction. Okay, so to kind of wrap up some of the things that might be affecting these physical activity patterns though, typically one of the issues when we're looking at extant, or extant hunter-gatherer populations is that modernization may have affected these types of things. But actually, interestingly, when you look at the studies that have actually assessed the degree of modernization's effect on physical activity patterns, i.e. by looking at education status, employment status in uh, hunter-gatherer populations that have been influenced 
by Western populations, you see that it doesn't seem to actually affect their physical activity levels that much at all. And I wonder whether that's maybe because actually they're not that much different from ours in the first place. Now, obviously, the physical activity levels and patterns that we see in hunter-gatherers are going to be affected by occupation duration, habitat quality, hunting, that type of thing as well, logistical mobility, you know, their actual geography. And we saw the same thing when we were looking at the extinct hunter-gatherer remains as well. But what I think is really important is the fact that although we see these divergent physical activity patterns between different populations, I think the focus on energy expenditure or physical activity levels as they're calculated is inappropriate because although we see similar physical activity patterns, we get drastic differences in terms of the actual physical activity uh, patterns, the modes of exercise and the types of uh, activities that they're actually engaged in. So again, I just think it's inappropriate to use them to actually draw exercise recommendations. Okay, so what can we conclude from this short review of this evidence? In essence, there is no one ancestral physical activity pattern. So how can we draw a generalized recommendation for exercise from it? We can't. It's very, very difficult to differentiate between what is an adaptation, i.e. an evolutionary adaptation to enhance reproductive success, something that affects our physical capacity, and whether that has determined whether we engage in a physical activity, or whether engaging in a physical activity has produced said physical adaptation. It's very, very difficult to draw out those relationships and look at the direction of them as well. I mean, even studies have found that there's very low to moderate and certainly inconsistent relationships between the actual physical activity levels that populations engage in and their actual physical fitness. And that's looking at physical activity levels in terms of total energy expenditure relative to uh, resting metabolic rate. So looking at it from this energy expenditure perspective, as I said. It's also difficult to determine whether or not our physical activity levels changed because we got smarter or we got smarter and thus changed our physical activity levels. Certainly in terms of endurance exercise, there's the argument that the two kind of went hand in hand, our ability to endurance run, our ability to engage in these types of activities like persistence hunting that's been argued. Now, I thought Skylar was going to give the same talk he was giving at AHS as well, where he talked about resistance training and its effect on the brain. So he's not, I've learned, so I would urge you to go and look at his talk on YouTube as well, because he discusses the effects that even strength type exercise and resistance type exercise can have on the brain as well. And it's difficult to determine the relationship between the two. When we look at extinct hunter-gatherers, it's impossible to determine what their physical activity pattern was. And even when we look at extant hunter-gatherers, there's drastic differences. But I do think there are some interpopulation similarities that we can draw from and then try and synthesize with what modern exercise physiology suggests. OK. There we go. So these are the current evolutionary fitness recommendations. From the most recent academic articles on the topic, from James O'Keefe and colleagues, including Lauren Cordain. So they generally tend to focus more on a low, high volume of low intensity, low to moderate intensity activity. And you see this 6 to 16 kilometers a day range that typically comes up that's been plugged out from one or two studies or so. They undulate high intensity activity with that low intensity activity. And there are other things that focus on the types and modes of exercise as well. So lots of walking, running, using uneven surfaces, barefoot exercise, this type of thing, including interval training sessions, resistance training sessions, and so on and so forth. But when you read through the specifics of these recommendations, they tend to be very romanticized and focus on a caveman-type workout. So in terms of resistance training, maybe we should be out flipping tires or picking up rocks or banging a hammer on tires and these types of things that you see in a lot of the CrossFit workouts and that sort of thing. OK, so what I want to do then is actually take some of the recent research from modern exercise physiology and see what elements of the evolutionary fitness recommendations can be supported and what can't, and what we can finally conclude in terms of some sort of you know, rational, sober set of recommendations regarding all of this evidence. So the question we're asking is, do the recommendations that have been made actually agree with what modern exercise physiology suggests? Do the recommendations that have been pulled from this review of the literature actually tie up with what we know from modern exercise physiology is best for improving cardiovascular fitness, strength, and hypertrophy. These physical fitness outcomes that we know are very well correlated with all-cause mortality, health, and well-being. Now, the current public health guidelines are obviously very focused on 
volume of exercise. And they've come under heavy criticism, as I said at the start, because what we're starting to see is actually the intensity of effort involved in the exercise seems to be the more important <coughs> component. So if we recall, all of those fit physical fitness measures seem to be more associated with reductions in all-cause mortality. And that higher intensity of effort, ex, uh, physical activity, seems to be more associated with it also. So what I think is we've been at fault focusing on this end of the spectrum in terms of exercise uh, intensity of effort. And what we should have been focusing on is this end, the brief high intensity type activity that seems to be far more supportive in terms of reducing all-cause mortality and morbidity. So we should have been focusing on the fact that actually hunter-gatherers typically engage in this. Whereas previously, we've been focusing more on the fact that they're more active, not the fact that actually they engage in some high quality and high intensity of effort activity. So what does the modern exercise physiology say about this? So in terms of cardiovascular fitness, there is growing evidence that intensity of exercise seems to be very important for it. We've all heard of high intensity interval training. The research seems to continually support that high intensity interval type training can actually improve cardiovascular fitness as much if not more than typical endurance type activity. It may not even be necessary to actually engage in interval type training or overcomplicate the program because one study has shown that actually single sprint type exercise maximally produces the same type of benefits as the interval training sessions do. So do we even need to overcomplicate it for cardiovascular fitness? The same seems to apply in terms of strength and hypertrophy as well. Consistently, the one variable that seems to be shown to be very important is the intensity of effort, so how hard you're actually training. All the other variables might matter to some degree, volume, frequency, the exercises you choose, and so on and so forth, but they pale in comparison to the effect that high intensity of effort exercise actually has on outcomes for strength and hypertrophy. Now, in terms of the recommendations for varying intensity and the frequency of exercise, there does seem to be some support for this idea of auto-regulating the uh, way in which you program your exercise. Periodization and varying exercise activity and that sort of thing seems to work better when it's actually individualised to the person and their context. So there's some support for that. And, shock horror as well, the mode of exercise doesn't even seem to be important and I'll touch on that briefly now. So, do we really need to be performing the same types of activities that hunter-gatherers typically engage in? Should we actually be emulating hunter-gatherers in terms of producing physical fitness outcomes? Now, skill versus fitness is something that's been discussed in the exercise physiology and strength and conditioning literature for a long time. And it's even debated within the studies looking at hunter-gatherer populations, particularly pertaining to hunting ability and that sort of thing. So there are some studies that show that fitness actually improves hunting ability, or at least is correlated with it. So upper body strength seems to predict hunting ability in certain populations. Strength significantly predicts archery accuracy in, hun in hunter-gatherer populations that use bow and arrow. But we also see that practice seems to be more important for them. So although, yeah, those uh, uh, strength uh, and, uh, seems to be associated with hunting ability, we don't know what the direction of causality is there as well. But we also actually see that it's more likely that practice makes perfect in these populations. And for them, they need to engage in those activities for their survival. So do we really need to be emulating those activities when we don't need to be performing them for our daily survival? So. What I want to question is whether or not statements like machines are bad because they don't emulate natural movements is a valid statement or argument to make. As a counter, I would say my colleague James Fisher has shown that training your lumbar extensors in isolation using a very sophisticated modern machine actually improves deadlift performance. Deadlift, picking up something heavy from the floor, couldn't, be a more possi you know, couldn't possibly be a more primal natural movement pattern. But doing a very modern type of exercise seems to improve that just as much. So the argument that we should be actually emulating hunter-gatherer physical activity patterns, I think, is a moot point. I don't think there's very uh, strong evidence for it. There's certainly very little evidence that engaging in those activities will actually transfer to other skills and motor abilities as well, as we've shown in recent review papers as well. So unless you actually somehow, for some reason, need to go out and pick up a bison, butcher it, hunt, whatever, all these sorts of things for your daily activities and uh, physical survival. I mean, does any of you guys live within a hunter-gatherer tribe? No. <laughs> 
So do you fit, oh, Ben, of course, you know, there's always got to be one. <laughs> See me after class. So, uh, but this is my point. Unless you actually need to engage in those skills, you don't need to practice those skills. And this ties up with what modern exercise physiology is starting to show as well. That when we're looking at these physical fitness outcomes, the ones that seem to be very important in terms of reducing all-cause mortality and morbidity, modality doesn't even matter. I mean, recent work from us and something I gave a talk on at the 2012 21 convention in London shows that the resistance aerobic training dichotomy as it's typically presented, the idea that aerobic endurance type activity improves your cardiovascular fitness but resistance training improves strength and hypertrophy and the two don't provide you know, crossover benefits. We've started to show that actually that's a false dichotomy because as long as resistance training intensity of effort is high enough, you see improvements in factors like VO2 max, running economy and so on and so forth, typical cardiovascular fitness parameters. But interestingly as well, if endurance type exercise or typical endurance type modalities, like cycling, if that's performed to a high intensity of effort, then recent studies actually show that strength and hypertrophy improves from that as well, to just as much as traditional resistance training. So the idea that modality is even important is just a moot point as well. Your muscles don't know what they're actually contracting against. As long as they're contracting intensely enough, then the benefits seem to come. So modality and thus the external resistance type, the actual type of uh, physical activity you're engaged in doesn't seem to matter for physical fitness. Now, a final point in terms of actually engaging in types and modalities of exercise. So we've highlighted that it doesn't seem to matter for physical fitness. We've highlighted that unless you're actually a hunter-gatherer, you don't need to be engaging in hunter-gatherer type activities. But that shouldn't mean that carte blanche, you just pick whatever exercise you want. What you need to do is consider other factors as well. And injury risk is a very important factor to consider because certain types of exercise have higher injury risks than others. And I'm sure Bill will be providing a great presentation uh, on whatever day it is he's presenting regarding some of the uh, risks associated with certain resistance training practices. Now, what I want to highlight is that there are certain exercise modes and types of activities that inherently have higher risks than others. So, for example, endurance running. Now, it doesn't matter whether you forefoot strike or rear foot strike or whether you're barefoot or whatever. There seems to be a high risk of injury from engaging in endurance running. Okay, yeah, we'll improve your physical fitness. If you enjoy it, great, do it. But when you're making these types of decisions, you need to weigh up the risk to reward ratio. CrossFit, pretend I didn't say that again. But recent studies that have looked at CrossFit have shown that the injury rates in them are extremely high. And what's even worse is not only are the risks high, but the actual severity of the potential injuries are very high as well. Because when we're looking at injury risk in exercise, we should be considering not only the prevalence of the injuries, but also the types of injuries that are, engaged, that are sustained as well. In the studies that have looked at CrossFit, 7% required surgical intervention. I don't know about you, but exercise is supposed to make you fit and healthy, not put you in the hospital. When you look at resistance training injuries as well, because resistance training you know, doesn't get a free ride just because endurance running produces a lot of injuries. Typically, endurance re uh, resistance training type injuries tend to stem from free weights and typically from people dropping free weights on them. So yeah, okay, so using a machine or using a uh, barbell doesn't seem to provide any differences in terms of strength or hypertrophy, but if you drop one on you, it's probably gonna hurt you a lot more. So you need to consider what the risks and rewards associated with those types of things are. Engaging in certain types of resistance training activity as well is important to consider. Olympic weightlifters in the 2012 and 2008 Olympic Games, they had a one in six chance of getting an injury whilst performing Olympic type lifts. And you've got to consider, these guys are the best in the world at this. And they still get injured one in six times. It's important to consider these things, guys. Okay. So let's wrap it up and let's draw some conclusions and, uh, and make some recommendations. So as I said, evolutionary fitness or paleo fitness is massively popular at the moment. And one of the purposes of this talk was to try and get you guys to think a bit critically about it in case you've been influenced by it and are thinking about maybe trying it and that sort of thing. Up until now, the recommendations have typically relied on suggestions that physical activity uh, adaptations should dictate what types of exercise we're engaged in. And I think that's a bit premature based on the research that we've reviewed here. Also, the fact that physical activity patterns in hunter-gatherer populations 
are so divergent and the fact that we can't actually draw out what the physical activity patterns of extinct hunter-gatherer populations were. So we can't even make recommendations based on the, that information because it doesn't exist. So historically, this focus has been on volume of physical activity. But as I've said, I think the intensity or the quality of the exercise that you're performing is far more important. It seems to be the most significant controllable variable to determine those physical fitness outcomes that we were talking about at the start. So, to draw, draw some recommendations in, I'm going to provide some very general recommendations here. What can you do? So one, you should select a mode of exercise based on your personal preference, if we're just considering the physical fitness outcomes, because as long as it's intense enough, it doesn't seem to matter what mode of exercise you're engaging in. So, choose it based on your personal preference, or choose it based on your sporting requirement if you're an athlete. But you need to consider on an individual basis the risk-reward ratio associated with those types of activities. It doesn't matter what you do in terms of getting fit, but if you're more likely to get injured doing that activity, only you can make the decision as to whether or not it's worth engaging in it. Two, focus on utilising a high intensity of effort during your exercise. That seems to be the most important factor. Don't worry too much about volume or frequency. Auto-regulate what you're doing. Train hard and you will get the benefits. And then kick back, relax, don't worry too much about being sedentary the rest of the time because funnily enough, we've got groups of healthy, fit, low disease rates in hunter-gatherer populations, prime, other primate species who spend a lot of time sitting around, not really doing a lot. So I wouldn't worry too much about overblown claims regarding <coughs> the effects of being sedentary. Thank you very much for listening, guys. If anyone's got any questions, I'd be glad to take them. All right, let's give it up for James Steele. Hey, James. Hey. Is there any actual evidence that compound exercises are, are produce muscles that are more adapted to competitive sports? Sorry, uh, are there any, uh, let me just repeat that. Are there, is there any evidence that compound exercises produce greater sporting performance improvements than other exercises? In a word, no, not particularly. If you, as I said, when we actually look at the compound, you know, the idea of training particular motor skills that transfer over to other motor skills, okay, what you've got to consider is that the adaptations that will occur in the musculature in response to the exercises that you're performing, that's what's going to actually transfer over. The ability to squat more is only going to be useful if you're actually a power lifter. So the skill associated with those types of movements are useful in sports that involve those types of movements. But squatting a barbell is not exactly the same as sprinting or engaging in any other kind of skill that, although it may involve that kind of triple, triple extension that the NSCA is so fond of, it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be performance improvements in res uh, resulting from that as well. It's also very hard to actually define sporting performance and actually research it and study it. We can only really look at um, kind of surrogate markers of performance, so like sprint speed, vertical jump height, those types of things as well. Um, and there doesn't seem to be that much evidence that there's a transfer of skill from performing a certain type of exercise to another. There seems to just be a general benefit of strengthening and producing hypertrophy in the musculature involved in those, those uh, types of movements. The only ways to produce more, um, uh, uh, better muscles for, for a sport is, are just to play the sport and otherwise you can do just any exercise to... Um, it, well, what I'm saying is you need to differentiate the uh, skill conditioning associated with the sport, so getting better at the sport as opposed to the physical conditioning, i.e. producing a more robust physiology to then take part in that sport. So the idea of trying to create sport-specific type activities in your training is a bit folly because all you're doing is training a motor skill pattern that is actually irrelevant for your sport. Because although it's superficially similar, it's not similar enough or it's not the same such that the motor skills will actually transfer over to that sport. You're better off producing an improved physiological fitness to then go and practice the skills involved in that sport. And that may involve compound exercises, that's fine but there's no uh, real evidence, in my opinion, that actually supports them being better than doing any other kind of uh, strengthening. I hope that answers the question. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, I have a question about. Um, it's really popular now. The sitting is killing us and stuff <laughs> like that. Could you cover that? Because they're making tables now that stand up and everything. Well. Uh, disclaimer, I do actually stand at work a lot. <laughs> I don't typically sit, but that's mainly because also I tend to walk around a lot at work anyway. Um, I'm actually in the process of uh, considering what my presentation for a conference next year is going to be, and one of the things I want to do is actually perform a more rigorous review of the, uh, the claims regarding sitting time and it killing you. Um, from what I can tell from the literature, it seems to be that uh, there's been very poor efforts to kind of control other confounding factors that might be associated with sitting. So people who typically spend a lot of time sitting typically engage in other unhealthy activities as well. So their diet's probably bad. They probably don't do any exercise. They probably, you know, they might smoke or they might have other psychosocial factors that might be influencing it as well. So one of the things I'd like to do is spend a bit more time going into the literature to try and draw out what the real association between sitting and all-cause mortality is, so looking at those hard kind of endpoints rather than looking at surrogate markers as well. Um, but I'm certainly not convinced at the moment that sitting is killing you. There seems to be a lot of uh, evidence counter to it as well when we consider things like um, the uh, populations we've looked at here. They do spend a fair amount of time sitting and that doesn't seem to have much of a negative effect on them. Um, there may be some, you know, counter effects in terms of there may be some bad effects of it that counter some of the beneficial effects of uh, my more higher intensity effort exercise. Um, but I'm, I'm not 100% convinced of that as of yet. Um, I have another question. Um, so if you do, if you go to the gym, what's better, isolation exercise, because you covered that, or full body exercises? And also after those high intensity trainings you've had, what supplements are the best? <laughs> Um, okay, well, in terms of compound versus isolation exercises, that's a very broad topic and it's a very broad question because it's specific to the musculature that you're actually looking to train. So the studies that have looked at comparing compound and isolation exercises for, for example, uh, changes in upper limb strength and uh, hypertrophy, so bicep, tricep hypertrophy, haven't really found much of a difference in terms of compound and isolation exercises. Um, so in terms of upper body exercise, it seems you can get the same benefits from doing compound pressing movements and compound pulling movements um, without the inclusion of isolation movements as well. Now obviously you've got to consider that the studies are always only 10 to 12 weeks in length, so whether or not it will make a difference over the long term, it's more difficult to say. But certainly there doesn't seem to be any specific benefit there, but contrastingly in my kind of specific area of research actually relates to uh, the lower back and lumbar extension type training. That seems to be an area that does benefit from isolation type work and it's very, very difficult to train using compound work. So for example, deadlift type training doesn't seem to have much of an effect on the lumbar extensor musculature specifically, whereas isolating them using specific equipment tends to have a more beneficial effect. So it's a question that has uh, different answers depending upon what muscles you're talking about. And supplements. And supplements. Uh, my advice is always, uh, um, I, I always send people to the same place, and I don't know whether I can say, uh, uh, say this up here or not, but uh, typically uh, I always stick to looking at examine.com for that. I, I'm not an expert in nutrition or supplementation, so I wouldn't want to step outside of my bounds. Um, but typically, if you want to know what I take, I take um, uh, creatine, whey protein, and vitamin D, and that's about it. They seem to be the only things that are consistently supported by the research. One more question, because we're just about out of time. Hey, thanks, James. If James was trying to increase his VO2 max, what would his weekly training look like? Well, my, uh, James is in me. Ah, yeah. Right, OK. Um, that's an interesting question, because I could increase my VO2 max by considering the specific protocol of the test that I was using and like I say actually improving my skill in that test so if I was doing a treadmill test I could spend some time practicing the treadmill test. Now if I was interested in just looking at what uh, physiological changes I could make to produce that I would be engaging in specific training for the musculature involved in that type of test. So I would be engaging in, say I was doing a treadmill VO2 max, I would be doing high intensity type resistance training, training my lower body musculature to failure and doing some running alongside it as well because obviously there is skill involvement involved in that as well. Uh, the idea of improving VO2 max is, uh, <laughs> it's funny, I've just been teaching sessions on this over the last few weeks for my second year physiology students. 
Um, it's, it's a concept that, uh, although it's very difficult to define and actually test properly VO2 max, you can test maximal oxygen consumption under certain conditions, and it's making sure that the test that you're performing is obviously replicable. So it, it depends on the test you're performing. If you just want to improve it and demonstrate you can improve it, then there's a way of doing that. But if you look at the literature, there seems to be uh, sufficient evidence to suggest that actually uh, just training the musculature involved in that intensely enough seems to produce the physiological adaptations that catalyze improvements in that physiological fitness outcome. So as we showed in the uh, paper that I gave the presentation on a couple of years ago, um, the few studies that have compared, for example, resistance training and aerobic type training on VO2 max um, seem to show that there's very little difference in terms of the outcomes, assuming they're both performed, uh, you know, the uh, intensity of effort is controlled in them. So for example, the resistance training is performed to failure, whereas the studies that haven't done that don't show that. Um, and in terms of the physiological adaptations that catalyze that, you see that obviously um, both modes of exercise, assuming the intensity of effort is high enough, produce improvements in mitochondrial biogenesis, so increased mitochondrial volume, uh, increased mitochondrial enzyme activity, increases in capillarization, so more blood blood flow to the local musculature, uh, and so on and so forth. So my training would be essentially resistance training to failure, because that's the training mode that I prefer. But I would uh, imagine I would get the same benefits from doing, for example, high intensity interval training uh, as I would from doing that. It's just that I prefer the strength training because, like I said in the presentation, I consider the injury uh, uh, risk to reward ratio of engaging that as well. And I feel I'm far less likely to injure myself training, doing resistance training than I am doing running. Let's give it up for James Steele. I know we got a ton more questions for him, but we're going to have to answer those outside because we still got two more speakers today and uh, some good stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys.